Uh, Tom, uh, if I could take a crack at this as a neophyte of what this immediately meant to me when I grasped this, uh, was that we see it, we see a God who pronounces a judgment of flood that many people who aren't Christians say that a terrible, terrible God would kill all of these people because of a flood, when in fact a careful reading of the Hebrew uh, about Noah suggests possibly that only his seed and his family was pure in their generations as far as being able to preserve that bloodline and that God in his long-suffering and patience waited up to the last moment uh, to wait for repentance of mankind until it was down to the last stage of being able to save uh, a bloodline for their own benefit and, and uh, their salvation. And so he, he actually lovingly, patiently waited for judgment, like we know is uh, illustrated clearly in, Bi in the Bible. Uh, then after this particular time, as you said, uh, when, he, when he picks his own uh, nation, uh, his, his, uh, his own group through Abraham, he warns them not to intermarry with others or strong uh, pronouncements against things like bestiality and sexual deviancy that would, would possibly uh, be any kind of throwback back to these kind of experiments done at this particular time. And then when they go into the land of Canaan, which mm -hmm. we now know from the 12 spies and others is just crawling with these Nephilim, according to the 12 spies reports and the activities of Joshua, uh, God reluctantly has to uh, ask them to completely wipe out these other people after he waited time for, for their uh, judgment as well. In fact, uh, the, the, uh, the people were kept in Egypt, his people, because the sins of the Amorites had not come to fullness at that time. And, and when the judgment was ready to be pronounced on them, uh, the, the children of Israel, particularly the men, were so prone to get these foreign wives that they had to completely be wiped out so we didn't have another genetic corruption of the seed of Christ. I know that's a long-winded discussion, but am I on the right track there in yeah, looking at the elaboration a, in Scripture? That, that's, that's a wonderful and accurate uh, rendering of what many scholars believe to be a fact. I mean, the, you know, Methuselah, his name means when he is old or when he is dead or gone, it will come. And yet he lived to be the oldest man on earth. What a, what a, wonderful, what a wonderful depiction of the long-suffering and patience and mercy of God, that the man who lived to be longer than anybody else on earth was kind of set out there as a timepiece by God that said it's not going to happen until he's dead and gone and he lived older than anybody else. And so, and so then, you know, to stay on track, eventually there's this saturation. And God commands Noah to build this ark and to prepare for a flood that's going to destroy every living thing on earth. And, and as you said, I mean, the very fact that God had to send this universal fiat of judgment like the flood. It illustrates how widespread this altered DNA had uh, eventually become. Um, I mean, the, 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 the Bible says that only Noah uh, was perfect, in his gen and therefore, by the way, his, by extension, his children. Only Noah was found perfect in his generation. And the Hebrew word for perfect here is the same word that's used in Leviticus to describe an unblemished sacrificial lamb. Uh, the meaning, therefore, was not talking about moral perfection. In fact, we know that moral that Noah was not morally perfect. It's, say, it, it's telling us that Noah was physically untainted. In other words, his DNA had not been corrupted or altered by the by this Nephilim saturation, as apparently the rest of the world uh, by that time had been. But now, you know, you leap leap forward from that. And anybody that has read, uh, especially my last couple of books, the Aramon Gate or Nephilim Stargates, understands clearly that there now is a solid preponderance of Scripture and ancient text to support the notion that what happened in Genesis 6 with the Watchers mingling their DNA with humans and animals in order to produce this body that they could incarnate or extend themselves uh, into our plane of existence, that this is something that is, uh, well, first of all, prophetically, I think it's indicated as it is going to happen again in the last days, but it's something that probably is happening right now. And so you have to evaluate what the, what the, almost the prophetic ramifications now of what we're doing uh, in, in biotechnology could portend. Well, Jesus himself said, as it were in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man returns. 
and that gives you interesting food for thought. Now, many may say, well, that just means that people were caught unawares when judgment happened. But it's very curious that the example he immediately gives in Scripture is he says that people were marrying and giving in marriage, which is the same kind of activity that caused this judgment to begin with in Genesis chapter 6. Um, the, so, well, so, so I want to make sure I understand. You're saying there is an ancient record that suggests this occurred and that uh, the, the, and caused judgment. Even Jesus gives some indications to not be surprised to see these things happen again. And all of a sudden in this, in this last generation of ours, we're seeing the same kind of activities now being repeated by modern science. And people with an eye on prophetic scripture need to stand up and take notice on what might be the supernatural agenda behind all this as well. Well, I'm saying several things. First of all, I'm saying that, that there is much reason to believe from prophecy, from the, from the prophecies of Scripture, Old and New Testament. There is much reason to believe that what we're doing now could be indicative of the end times. Secondly, I'm saying that even if you're not a believer, you ought to be concerned right. about the unnatural alteration of living organisms, which neither creation nor evolution, if you have to believe that, uh, allowed for. And secondly, I, and thirdly, I, I'm saying that I think there were reasons why the Watchers did what they did, um, and, and, that it, and, and that that also is prophetic. Now, as far as scriptures, um, first of all, you know, you look at scriptures like Daniel 2.43. And it says, and, and, and this is talking about, you know, the end of time and, the, and the, the last Roman Empire, the revived Roman Empire. It says, and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay, end quote. Hmm. Um, th there's a personal pronoun there, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And that's right out of the King James, right? It's right out of the King James. And this is something that when you read this scripture, you don't, you don't have to do anything fancy to try to change what it's saying. It, it will stagger your mind to contemplate and read it in any version, read it in, the, read it in the Hebrew, to contemplate the significance of this passage and its implication for the future of global governance because it's talking about the, the end times revived Roman Empire. But, but, but this strange verse, I mean, th this verse in Daniel seems to indicate that in this last revived Roman Empire, that the same phenomenon that was occurring in Genesis 6, where non-human species or non-seed was mingling with human seed and producing these giant or nephilim, that, 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 that maybe that kind of same phenomenon is going to be occurring again in the revived uh, Roman or New World Order. Mm -hmm. Another thing. But when these non-seed, who mingle themselves with the seed of men, when that verse is coupled with Genesis chapter 3, an incredible tenet starts emerging, and that is that Satan has seed, and that it is at enmity with Christ. Genesis 3 says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. The word, the word that's translated there is, is the Hebrew word zira, and it, it only means one thing. It means offspring, descendants, children, progeny. So, so then, with all these other verses combined, you know, you, you start thinking: Is there a satanic, you know, is there a satanic posterity, a seed? Is there something lurking behind gateways, waiting for some final opportunity? itself with human DNA just like it did in the days of old? Uh, is that the method by which the Nephilim will return? Because there are scriptures that also talk about a return of the Nephilim, the giants, in the last days. Um, is, 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 is what we're doing today, is this a method by which Antichrist will become incarnated? Um, if, if Genesis 6 is truly an account of rebel angels, leaving their assigned habitation and cohabiting with human females, out of which union these mutant life forms were born, then is it reasonable to assume that Satan as a fallen angel already has, or will be allowed to have, some ability to mingle 
his material with the DNA of a woman to produce uh, an offspring. And this is, this is something that you find in the scriptures, even with the prophecies of the Apostle Paul, talking about him being the, the son of perdition. And the, the Greek word there, perdition, is apoleai, the, the apollyon, the demon destroyer. That there literally could be some method by which we're going to ex uh, experience a return of the giants and also the, the coming of an antichrist at a time when humanity is willing to start playing God, to take the place of God like the watchers tried to do, to shake their fist in the face of God, to be Luciferian enough to say, I will be like God. I will exalt my throne above the stars of heaven. And they, and they literally tried to change creation, which brought about judgment, and yet here we are today doing the same thing. Hmm. So this would be some kind of uh, uh, blasphemous type of uh, fraud or photocopy of the virgin birth, uh, like Satan tries to do at all times, to try to replicate in his own twisted way what, what our Heavenly Father does. Well, you know, it, it, one of the things that interested me when I started doing this research um, uh, and, and and there again, you know, keep in mind that I started out studying, you know, what was going on with modern biotechnology, especially transgenics and biotechnology, and wanting to know what it might portend for the future, and couldn't find any records, but I did, kept running into this ancient record where this had occurred, the blending of humans and animals, and it had led to chaos, and I thought, is this... Did God allow this record to remain a universal record in the past as a warning that might portend the dangers of playing God in the future and crossing over these species barriers? So keeping that in mind, um, when I started reading then, all, all of the available records, keeping the Bible as my number one authority, uh, against which nothing else could conflict, and then reading all these other, uh, script, these other ancient books that were referred to, by the writers of the Old and New Testament. Um, I, I come to find out that, first of all, these beings wanted to leave their plane of existence. Okay. And in order to do that, they used women and animals uh, to create the pathway, the body, that they could extend themselves into. In fact, the Septuagint version um, of, the, of, the, of the, the book of Genesis 6 says, the B'nai Elohim saw the daughters of man, that they were fit extensions. So the, the whole essence here is that they wanted to leave their plane of existence, as is verified by Peter and Jude in the New Testament. They wanted to leave their plane of existence. They wanted to come into our reality. And I had asked myself that if I was to remain true to the most um, um, conservative interpretation of Christian scholarship, why would these angels have needed to blend animals and humans? That was my challenge. Why, why did they have to do that? And it goes to your question. And, and, and I came to believe that these beings had to blend species in order to create a body into which they could extend themselves because every creature up until that time as it existed had its beginning in God. Uh, all life extended back to the Creator, who had spoke it into existence by his own breath. The bara, it's a wonderful study, it's just a glorious, wonderful study about God, who is the only one who has the ability to stand back and speak, bara. And when, that, when he enunciates his voice, he can call forth raw, atomic, nuclear energy so that it comes forth into specified molecular forms, so that he speaks and he makes a, a human, he speaks and he makes a rock, he speaks and he makes a tree. Everything at the base level, being made of the same kind of electrons and neutrons spinning around, forming different molecular density, but he only can call forth and command that it be ordered in a particular way. And then once he makes these things, he, he touches the man and he breathes into his nostrils of his own life force, and man becomes a living soul fashioned after the image of God. So he sets all of these things in motion, and he gives every living thing the power from that point forward that's intelligent, um, or that 
that matter, just living, living organism, everything to cre recreate after its own kind. And, and here's the important thing. This phrase, after its own kind, is, is extraordinarily important. 